All right. Woo-hoo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining. Uh, as uh, uh, I can't pronounce your name, said, uh, I am a Commons committer and work on uh, DBCP and MPool and, and several other Commons components. And I'm here to talk uh, mostly about the 2.0 versions that were just recently released. So the top level message is, you know, we're sort of back from the dead. We, <laughs> we went through a long and painful period of really, let's just call it not the best maintenance. And uh, I take some personal accountability for that since I was around for the, for the whole time. Uh, but we, you know, we, we actually have finally now really uh, revitalized both Commons Pool and Commons DBCP, and hopefully you'll see some of that today. Um, the, you know, the, we've just recently released version two of DBCP and a couple of revs of version two of, of Commons Pool. And uh, the, the most important thing is that, you know, from my perspective at least, is that the code is becoming scrutable. I know the spell checker didn't complain about that word. I, I believe it actually is a word because it used to be manifestly inscrutable. And that was one of our real challenges. One of the reasons that they went into kind of disrepair is there were the very few people willing to actually dive into the code because it was so hard to follow and understand. It's been improved significantly, thanks largely to Mr. Thomas over there. And uh, it's, still not, it's still not done. In other words, there's still a lot of cleanup left to do. Uh, they're really genuinely interesting problems. One of the things I love about working on Pool and DBCP is the problems are interesting. There are, you know, it's, it's not, mo- most of the time as developers, we solve simple problems with simple solutions, and, and that's fine, that's the right thing to do. In Pool and DBCP, we have some genu- genuinely hard problems to deal with, and uh, so it's, it's fun. So that, that sort of ends the, the commercial portion of the program. Uh, I, I definitely encourage anyone, uh, any of you who are interested in getting involved, just, uh, you know, pop over to Commons and join us. We have a lot of, uh, we certainly welcome patches. Okay, so that's the end of the commercial message. Um, I'm gonna kind of whiz through general overview of Pool and DBCP and then really drill down into the, into the two dados. So Pool and DBCP are old. They were pretty much as old as Commons. Uh, DBCP provides the database connection pool that ships by default with Tomcat, and Commons Pool is the object pool that is used by DBCP to actually manage the connections. That's the connection between the two components. Commons Pool is a generic pooling implementation that can be used for anything. It can be used for sockets. It can be used for message queues. It can be used for, people have used it for all kinds of exotic stuff. Every once in a while in a bug report, somebody is pooling you know, something I've never heard of. And uh, so Pool is a uh, general purpose pooling infrastructure and DBCP is, is really for connections. Okay, so um, Pool, provides, as I said, a, a kind of standard uh, interface, which has changed in 2.0, for representing uh, object pools and uh, factories to produce objects, to be managed by object pools. And um, the, the most widely used implementation is the generic object pool. That is what serves as the basis for uh, DBCP's management of connections. The other significant implementation that's very frequently used in pool is the generic keyed object pool, which you can think of as a map of pools. So when you ask a generic keyed object pool for an instance, you give it a key, and it gives you one of the instances that's pooled under that key. Okay. Um, Pool also provides a number of uh, additional pool implementations that behave a little bit differently from the generic object pool. I'm not really gonna say anything about them other than I already mentioned. Uh, the key pool. DBCP provides a pool-backed data source implementation. So it looks like a data source, it acts like a data source, but behind it, it's actually managing a pool of connections. It can also do cool stuff like try to clean up abandoned connections. That is evil. Hear me today, hear me tomorrow. I, I'm old enough to remember, I don't know this, it may even predate your involvement, Mark, when, when the first discussion was had about should we have this aband- abandoned connection cleanup stuff. And I was actually over in Tomcat line and they said, oh, it's evil, no, no, don't do it. And sometimes I think it w- would have been a better idea not to do it. Because basically what it tries to do is it tries to, uh, you know, if you're a developer, if you're a sloppy developer, you forget to close your connections after you use them or, you know, on exce- especially on exception paths, what will happen is, a connection will, uh, you know, will go orphaned, 
And the pool still thinks that, that connect, the physical connection is in use because it was never returned. And one way to, and then quickly you're going to run out of physical connections, you're going to run out of cool pool capacity, you're not going to have any fun. So the feature was added to somehow rig the pool to keep track of the connections that they've been out too long, just nuke them, and then uh, return the capacity back to the, nuke the handles and return the capacity back to the pool. Okay. Um, so that's, that's DBCP. DBCP comes in a lot of flavors now, and that's mostly to go along with the wonderfully incompatible changes in the JDBC API. Sun likes, well actually it's not Sun, Oracle now, uh, likes to change the incompatibly. JDBC with well, every once in a while in a JDK release, and that forces us to actually release different versions. Uh, the top two versions in the, the 1.x line there are the old 1.x code, and likely 1.3 won't see any more releases. 1.4 will probably eventually, it depends on volunteer engineering and all that stuff, will probably release. The 2.0, what we're going to mostly talk about today, is a, uh, requires JDK 1.7, JDBC 4.1. So that's most of what we're talking about today. Uh, as I said, what pool does, or I'm sorry, what DBCP does, is it maintains a pool of connections. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the changes, about the pool 2, then DBCP 2, and then I'm going to try to drill down. Okay, um, first of all in pool 2, the core pooling algorithms are completely rewritten. Uh, pool 1 had, had, had some elegance to it, although as I said, the code was inscrutable, but it had some elegance to it because it worked like it's almost like, you know, made from, I don't know how, what the right metaphor is, but it, 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 the initial pool code was probably JDK 118 or something. I mean, it, was, it, it used wait notify. Uh, it did not even, you know, pre-JDK 1.5 concurrency primitives. So it was all wait notify. We, had, we added on in pool 1.5 a sort of countdown latch infrastructure. Uh, very hard to manage and very hard to make perform. And, very limited scalability. When you had a lot of threads, it just started churning. Uh, so what we did in, in pool two is completely rewrote it and put a, uh, a, a real uh, kind of civilized infrastructure on it. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, more momentarily. We added metrics in JMX instrumentation, which again, way beyond, we had nothing in pool one. Pool one had you couldn't tell what was going on. Other, you know, you knew how many objects were active. You could get num active. You could get num idle. That was about it. You couldn't get any more statistics about how many objects had been borrowed, how many had been returned, how old were objects in the pool, what was going on actually in the pool, what was going on among the objects that were borrowed out. None of that was available in pool one. In pool two, it's rich. We have rich instrumentation available and all exposed via JMX in pool two. Um, we also have robust instance tracking. One of the fun, one of the, again, it was sort of elegant but incredibly limiting feature of pool one. Pool one did not maintain references to objects that were in circulation. It maintained only the bare minimum that it had to to be a pool, which was a list of idle objects. And when they came back, they get shoved back in there, and then when they're, they're loaned out, they're, they're handed back out. We did not track. DBCP had this kind of bolt-on, uh, abandon object pool thing that tried to do that, but pool itself had nothing, and it didn't track the objects. It knew nothing about how long an object had been sitting in the pool, uh, how long, when it was created, how old it was. None of those things were available via pool in pool one. In pool two, all of that information is exposed. The objects are tracked throughout their life cycle from the time they're created, while the entire time that they're under management by the pool, we have uh, some serious um, tracking available, and we'll talk a little bit about what, what that means. One of the benefits of the tracking is that the factories have access to the state of the pooled object, to how old it is, when it was last checked out, when it was last idle. All that information is available to the, to the object factory. Now, the object factory is the thing that decides whether to validate it, it activates it, it passivates it. All those actions that the factory does on all the usage, every time, you know, the, as the object comes back through the pool and gets, you know, rinse, repeat, all those actions have available to them all of the kind of uh, pooling history of the object, which uh, makes it possible to do things like, you know, I'll show an example. 
where what you can do is in DBCP, suppose that I want to, uh, for some reason, I, I never quite understood why somebody wanted to do that, but they did. What they wanted to do was limit the absolute lifetime of a connection. Say, if a connection is more than so long, not, not just hasn't been used in so long, but is absolutely older than four hours, I want to kill it. That kind of thing we could never have done with uh, the pool one infrastructure. Pool two, we can do it fairly easily. Okay, um, now DBCP at, at a high level. These are high level things, um, and then I'm, I'm gonna drill down into some of them. I, DBCP has its own JMX instrumentation, which is beautifully integrated with the pool JMX. Uh, all the names li link up just like you know, you'd want them to, and you look at the data source, then you can see its pool, then you can see its statement pool. All that stuff can be drilled down through GMX. So uh, also lots of instrument, lots of metrics associated with DBCP. Uh, it's got, DBCP has much better connection lifecycle management. One of the funny things that you have to deal with with a, being a data source and sort of acting like a, a virtual, at well, being a data source and giving connections back to people is that when a connection comes back to you from the pool, or from a client who's used it, you, you kind of, you have to restore its state in some reasonable way. And the way that that happens, how much database interaction is required in making that happen, all of that stuff has been both optimized and improved in, and made more configurable in, in DBCP2, which has resulted in mass, very massive performance improvements for some applications. <clears throat> there are also massive performance improvements associated in DBCP2 because of the underlying pool implementation being way more scalable and better. And also, the, there, the, we've reduced synchronization and, and improved the efficiency of a lot of the basic code in DBCP2 itself. It had some terrible synchronization bottlenecks in it before, which have been removed in version two. Finally, we've integrated with, uh, a started security manager integration. So uh, you, if you're running under a security manager, you can, you can restrict clients getting connections from the pool. Okay, I could stop here, and I, I don't have enough time to go through all the content that I have, but I am gonna drill down a little bit more. I should have said this at the beginning. These slides that I'm flying through here, actually camping on a few and flying through the rest, are really an update of a talk I gave back in 2010 that was meant to be kind of a configuration guide for pool and DBCP at that time. What I, this, and those slides were downloaded, a lot of people got a lot of use out of them, so I decided what I would do is update fully all that configuration guide, all of the examples of usage, all that stuff, that's all in here. I'm not gonna go through it all because I also have to talk about what's new, which we're doing right now. So as I fly through, uh, realize slides are gonna be available, they'll be available on the, on the conference website, they're also available on my slide share. Okay, so let's just plow ahead. Uh, Pool two API change. Okay, the, the, the big deal, what the, the thing that makes all the wonderfulness around tracking possible is that pool two traffics in wrapped objects internally. We have a pooled object interface that basically wraps an object that's gonna be managed in the pool. The, the client still works with just the objects that it wants. That's nice, from a client perspective, you don't have to wrap and unwrap yourself but the factory methods actually use the pooled objects, and we'll, we'll really, we'll drill down into that. Uh, and, and as I said before, the tracking is available to the factories themselves. Here's a, I, I mentioned this example, and it's a, it's, a, it, it's a pretty simple example. It's inside of DBCP, and this core validate, validate lifetime method is used by the factory methods in the poolable connection factory. So that, that example that I gave where let's try to limit the physical lifetime of a connection, it's enabled by this. The, the kind of relevant piece is right here, that you can actually get the create time on the pooled object. Because that wrapper is walking around with the object through the infrastructure, what I can ask is, hey, when were you created? And then based on when, when you're created, I can decide to blow you up or not. Okay, so that's a really simple example showing how the factories having access to that pooling, pooled object history information, the tracking information on the pooled objects, enables more cool stuff to happen. Okay, the factory interface is, is pretty simple. 
it's, this is a, a significant change from where we were in pool one, and the, and the key things are now that those core factory methods now take pooled objects as opposed to objects themselves. The basic life cycle is basically the same. The pool creates objects as they're needed, and when they're, they're borrowed, they get, uh, they get activated con configurably. They could be, uh, they could be um, validated or not, and then when they're returned, if their test on return is, is enabled, they, they end up getting validated as well there. But the pool clients still create the objects as needed. One thing that has been added is that we have a test on create option so that when the pool actually creates something, it can be validated. But what's kind of important here is because these wrappers have to get reattached to the objects, when an object is returned to the pool, the pool has to be able to recognize it. And we'll see a little bit more about what that means. Uh, the client API is very similar to pool one. Uh, you, you, as I said, you, you borrow and you just get what you're looking for. If it's a connection, it's a connection, just like pool one. You, you borrow uh, objects directly, you invalidate, you, add, do, you call add objects, that, those are all the same. But as I said before, the, the, it's extremely important that in pool two, objects, instances that are not equal <coughs> have to be discernible by equals. So distinct instances have to be discernible by equals. If, the, if your equals implementation is an equivalence relation and you got separate physical instances that, that look equal and you, and, and you try to return them to the pool, it will blow up. Because it, what it does is it looks, at, it looks at the object, says, okay, who is this guy? I can find this guy, now I'll put him back, I'll, I'll take his wrapper, and I'll mark his state as returning to the pool, and I'll go on my, my merry way. If I find him and it looks like he's already been returned to the pool, that's a semantic violation. That's a violation of the pool contract, and I'm gonna throw. So it is important that uh, distinct instances are discernible by equals. Okay, uh, so okay, here's a pooled object. The pooled object interface is, um, is, is you know, the, this new, the new thing that's now being managed by the pool it's got the get object. It's got a get object allows you to unwrap the thing and get it. Factories need that because they need to, like for example, destroy has to be actually actually nuke the thing. So get object is a, is a, it actually gets you the object itself. Uh, allocate. We'll talk a little bit about these states, but one of the really good advances in in pool two is we we kind of really thought through all of the junk that we had in pool one around when an object is undergoing one action and somebody else tries to, like, the worst thing in pool one was we have this idle object of Victor. It walks through the pool and decides, you know, who's too old and rotten and I'm going to kill. Uh, you can configure idle object eviction in, in pool one and, and in pool two to walk along the pool, look at instances, see they haven't been used in too long, I'm going to kill the thing. That's a fine feature. What we didn't quite implement 100% right in pool one was the thinking about, well, what happens when somebody is being evicted and then that instance is actually loaned out to a client at the same time? So imagine that the evictor is about to kill, nuke an instance, and a client checks it out. Well, you know, in, in the earlier, in like version 1.3 of pool, that couldn't happen because we just synced the heck out of everything. Everything was so synced that that couldn't happen because we all excessively synchronize. Uh, in pool two, we were smarter about it. The sync lock actually only has to be on the thing itself, right? When you think about it, the victor just has to say, okay, this thing right here, don't, don't give it out. Or if you do give it out, then you, know, you gotta like give it back. And, uh, and, and that, uh, that's what essentially what, the, what, these, what these mutators do. Pooled object state we'll talk about and there's also getters. This is the, the kind of cool thing about the pooled object interface. There's getters for all these statistics. Creation time, last idle time, last borrow time, last time the thing was used. Okay. So the states, I, I've, uh, I'm not gonna go through all of them. I'll mention this funny one because this is the kind of cool one that, uh, that deals with that kind of sync problem that we had where uh, I'm gonna, I'll tell you, well, I'll tell you now, I won't have to tell you later. The way the pool actually works is 
uh, it's, a, it's a queue. The, the backing store is a link blocking deck. And when somebody borrow, wants to borrow, and, it's, and what's in there is, is pooled objects. Client shows up, there's idle stuff in there. Client says, I, give me something. What the borrowing thread does is it grabs the first thing that's on there. It grabs the first thing that's on there. Now, what if the evictor happens to be working on that guy that I just grabbed out of the pool? That's perfectly legitimate, the use case that I just described. Well, what will have happen is the, the evictor will have actually, uh, the, the evictor will have put it into eviction state when it got there. It says eviction state. But then when the borrowing thread grabs it, it goes, oh, crap. This thing's like an, a victim. It's, a, it's undergoing eviction. I can't actually have it. So what I'm going to have to, so what I'll do is I will mark its state as, um, as well, I, what I, I'll have to, what I'll do is I, I want the evictor to go ahead and finish. But I need, after the evictor finishes, I need it to go back on the queue because I don't want to leak the capacity. So it sets its state to this funny state. And then the evictor, when it finishes, it actually shoves it back onto the front of the queue. Okay, so that's just a, it's a funny corner case, but it's an example of the kind of control that you get by having the states, maintaining the states. Okay, um, default pooled object is a default implementation of the pooled object interface. It's the one you should use in your own, your own factory should create and traffic in these things. Your make object should make, uh, you, you wish you would subclass or just directly use default pooled object because it does all the right things. It manages the state transitions correctly when the um, you know, different actions are happening on the object, and um, it also has a management interface. It has cool management interface. You can actually see all that stuff through, through JMX. What is even double cool is that we have this list all objects operation. So you're looking at the console, you can actually list out all the objects and then get all their information <laughs> through, um, you know, through JMX. Okay. So, uh, pullable connection factory. So th this is an, an example of, of the an implementation of, you know, a part of the implementation of a new object factory, a new pool to object factory. You can see the make object is returning a, uh, a, a pooled object, and what it does, the sort of standard way to modify your factories to work in pool to is just to have them return a new default pooled object that wraps the thing that you just created. And notice that destroy, I mentioned, uh, destroy actually goes and gets the object and then kills it. It's pretty simple. So the, the, the pool website has examples, you know, has some description about what you do to, to move from pool one to pool two, but that's really basically it. All you have to do is retrofit your factories to work like this. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about JMX and uh, Oh, and and I, I think I'm going to actually skip this because I'm going to I'm going to show a whole lot of it. But basically, all of the pool properties, the total number the total number of instances that have been borrowed from the pool, how many have been returned, destroyed, destroyed by the evictor, all of that stuff is available through uh, at pool, through the pool level JMX. We also have rolling stats on things like how long, uh, what was the mean client wait time. That kind of stuff is, was unimaginable in pool one. Now you can, you can get very good information about what's going on with the pool via JMX. Um, number of pool waiters, the number of clients that are waiting on the pool, that's, that's available. And you can configure the JMX name by default, they just get named sequentially pool one, pool two, blah, blah, blah. Uh, instance level, uh, the, the creation time, last bar time, number of times the thing was borrowed, um, and the stack trace. This is another one that you have to worry about. Uh, not to do in a holiday spirit. Just like, you, you don't do abandoned connection cleanup unless you absolutely have to. Uh, this stuff is a little bit dangerous because it's gonna ge it generates a stack trace. It's cool and useful in debugging, but if you run that stuff in production all the time, there's a lot of overhead. Because what it actually does is it creates a little exception, throws it blip, 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 and grabs the stack trace and makes that stack trace um, available to you, to the client. Uh, I mentioned uh, eviction policies were configurable. That's another, uh, actually I didn't mention it, but it was on the slide, that um, is another improvement in pool two that you can, we had gotten lots of requests over the years to have in, implement different kinds of schemes for eviction. And what this 
what we've enabled here is just an interface. You implement the interface. You provide the class name and configuration. And you do whatever you want. OK. Uh, a little bit of implementation detail. I mentioned before it's a link blocking deck under the covers. We actually hacked or modified the, um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the Harmony 1.6 sources to expose the, the, the reason we had to do that is we had to get, be able to get the waiters for uh, the threads that were, w that were waiting on the deck. And the reason we needed that was to cover another one of these ugly pieces of family history in the pool. Uh, part of our sordid, painful family history with Commons Pool is when the pool got closed, there's really no, we had no mechanism for notifying waiting threads for, you know, you just sort of, things would hang. So in order to implement close properly, we needed to be able to do that. Um, and let's see, I, I mentioned before that the, the this, this magical, that what makes it all go is really this, well, from a, from a uh, tracking standpoint, is that we shove all of the objects into a concurrent hash map. Notice that that hash map is keyed on the object. That's what I'm, I said before. So that means that when you're going to find the thing, well, you're going to use the object itself. That means equals better work right for the objects that you're sticking in there. OK. Uh, I'm not going to go. I think I already kind of described this. The, the only thing I'm going to mention on this slide, which you can read at your leisure when you download or whatever, is pool. There's, there's only really two threads of interest in pool. When, when, a, when an, uh, a client arrives at the pool and and say there's nothing in there, but say or there's nothing in the I, there's nothing idle, and yet max the maximum number of instances isn't attained, like maybe something got destroyed in validation or we haven't ramped up yet, or for, for whatever reason it's possible to create a new object. The the thread the borrowing thread itself creates that new object. It doesn't go and request it and somehow get it magically delivered to its via UPS later. It it, it waits and and does that create similarly destroys. If validation fails or, on, or activation fails on an instance that has been delivered to a client from the pool, that client, it does, it, that client doesn't give it over to some garbage crew and say, hey, destroy this later. That guy waits for that thing to happen. So there's really, in pool it's very simple. That there's the borrowing threads and there's the maintenance thread. No other magical threads running around doing mysterious work. So it's just something to keep in mind and it's another point I always make when talking to anybody about pool, is you, you, gotta, you gotta be careful to make sure that your factory methods perform okay and they're thread safe. If your th factory methods are not thread safe or don't perform well, then you, you're gonna, and, and you have a decent, and you have structural object churn in the way that your pool is configured, you're gonna have a lot of pain. So having object, having uh, factory methods that perform relatively quickly, and, uh, and our thread safe is very important. Okay, um, I'm like in not very good time shape here, so I'm gonna fly through the configuration stuff and just hit the highlights of DBCP. Uh, Configuration-wise, we've renamed some things, and these slides and the website will tell you about the renaming, so I'm not gonna go into detail about every one, you know, we, but the bottom line is we rationalized the names. Like Max Active was a bizarre name that made it seem like it could be just the ones that are lo loaned out. Uh, a lot of the, the time-related things, they have millis ended on, on the end of them if they're milliseconds, and if they don't, they're seconds. All that kind of stuff has been cleaned up. Um, I don't know if there's other, I guess the, I guess the, you know, that's not even worth really talking about. Um, One, one that's been split apart. We've had two, these two configurations that have been split between uh, remove abandon on borrow, remove abandon on maintenance. It used to be just remove abandoned, which meant that you were gonna you know, try to remove abandoned things. The other thing I did, I think I mentioned it but didn't quite emphasize it, is that all of the abandoned object pool stuff that was in DBCP has now moved into pool. And it's really just configuration options of commons pool. So uh, the generic object pool itself just directly exposes this stuff. Okay, so, um, oh, I, I, I did mention the eviction policy class name. You can actually specify 
a, a class name for your own implementation of the eviction policy implement, uh, interface, and then get eviction policy to work however you want. You can see there's a JMX name. Test on create is new. Usage tracking is another one. Another new thing that, again, not to be used in a holiday spirit. If every time you check a, an object out of the pool, then uh, you, you can record it. You can, you know, if it's, if it's so configured, you can record a stack trace of the, of the um, actually, every time even you use an object, client, a client uses an object, you can get a stack trace and make that available. Okay, so situations to avoid. Uh, again, this stuff is all, um, you know, sort of just essentially the, the same thing that I went on before, so I'm, I'm not going to dwell on it. But the, the important message here is that be mindful of what you're asking the pool to do. It's, uh, what I always do is when I'm thinking through problems associated with, with my own pools or reported problems that users have, is I, I try to think about, well, what does the pool have to do if you set its configuration in this way and load goes the way that, that, you know, that, that, it, that I think it does? So for example, if your load is variable, if your load goes up and has big spikes in it, and you set, you have a big difference between max active and max idle, well, what's going to happen there? What's going to happen there is you're going to spike up to all the ones that you can make. And then when the load comes back, you're going to kill the, all those things off. And then you're going to create them again and kill them off and create them again and kill them off. And your factories are going to, you know, the factories could have latency. That's going to really have a massive impact on performance. Uh, there's a, there's a, a little kind of funny framework in the common sandbox called performance that enables you to configure load variations of all different kinds. You can have it ramp up and down. You can have stochastic distribution. You have all kinds of stuff and how load behaves. And then you can configure the pool with different configurations, and you can see what happens. My 2010 talk has a bunch of simulations in it that show these kinds of things, what happens. In, with pool two, it, 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 there's really isn't a whole lot of difference. The pool performance itself is trivial compared to what happens when your factories and other things have latency. OK. Um, DBCP, I'm going to talk now a little bit more about the, the improvements there. So uh, fewer database round trips. They, they, and this kind of depends on the driver, how the, how the driver does this. You can do, you can say, you can, have it can, you can have it just use is valid on the connection as opposed to running a validation query. Running a validation query, take a database round trip, use is valid, bang. You can, we can cache the default auto commit and, and read only settings. So you don't actually have to, again, depending on the driver, a whole bunch of round trips are eliminated if you, if you enable that caching. You can configure whether or not to roll back when auto commit is, is, is false. We got reduced synchronization scope, as I mentioned, and obviously a better pool. OK. Um, a better control. There's lots more, lots of improved control in DBCP. Uh, query timeouts can be configured at the actual uh, connection level, the, the individual queries submitted by, by clients. Uh, you can, this is another thing not to do, but it could be fun to play with, um, is, <laughs> well, you, you implemented it. Um, asked for it. Right, user, exactly, exactly. This is the one, one great thing about Apache, great thing about how we work. Is if, if it's not going to break things and somebody submits a patch and it's a, it's a good, uh, you know, it's a feature that, that isn't going to blow things up, well, we go ahead. And this is kind of, I mean, it's cool to try to do it, but you can actually, via JMX, you can, you can force kill a connection. And actually, that's, it's, it's not that bad. I mean, sometimes things go into zombie state, and, and, and people really did want to be able to do this. Uh, you can also force a return to the pool of just a wrapper. When I know this one is abandoned, I'll go ahead and return him. Uh, himself. Uh, connection validation on creation, connection lifetime, eviction policies. I mentioned that's really comes for free from pool and security manager. I mentioned that too. Okay, here's the last remaining graphical uh, beauty in this presentation. And this is really cool. Um, it actually shows up better on the screen than, than I thought it would. So this is actually a view where I've got a, I've got a basic data source. I named him Foo which, by the way, the setter doesn't do, do automatically yet. Um, and then Foo has a pool of connections that, that is 
conveniently logically named connections. It gets the JMX name connections. And then the connections within it get named with numbers, test one, two, three, four. Here's connection one. I could look at his attributes and, but I also, he also has, this thing is configured to pool prepared statements. So he has a statement pool, which is a generic keyed object pool. That thing is named statements. And I can then go and do list all operations on that statement pool, and I can see the statements in the pool. So here's actually the SQL that created statement number one in the pool associated with connection number one in the connection pool associated with that data stores. So you can, all this stuff is drilled. This is, this is a, you know, just uh, a straight, straight uh, J console screenshot. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, I need to fly here. Uh, I mentioned, I, I really mentioned most of this, the, the JMX, and I'm gonna kind of skip over all of the configuration until I get to the new stuff. Uh, one of the, another thing I didn't mention before is you can actually specify the class loader used to uh, load the JDBC driver, which is, is new in, in pull two. The query timeout I mentioned, uh, enable call, I mentioned this one, auto commit, and cache state is what enables you to, to not, um, not necessarily actually muck around and, and do the getters on the state of the, uh, of the connection uh, coming back to the pool. Uh, eviction policy class name, that's again, uh, if you wanna specify a custom eviction policy, JMX name is the name, uh, it's a requested name, so it's a bad name, yeah, it's not gonna work, that's fair enough. And then this thing, the maximum lifetime. Okay. Uh, oh, ab abandoned usage tracking is, uh, I, I mentioned it in pool. It's surfaced via JMX or uh, in JDBC via this property. And uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, the rest of the stuff is, is fairly straightforward. Okay, I, what I'm gonna do now is just kinda, I wanna have time for questions, so I'm just gonna skip to the very end. I skipped over the configuration examples, which are kind of slightly modified from the thing I did in 2010, and you, you, know, you can certainly look at them, but I, I wanna have time for questions. So I just wanna end with, um, you know, be realistic, that the, the real thing that happens when you deal with pooled resources is the, what determines everything is the latency associated with the factory methods and whatever you're doing with the objects. What it, if it's a connection pool, you know, the latency of your database. And so, you know, it, it, the math is kind of inescapable here. So here's a little simple example. Suppose I have 10, you know, instances that are my object pool has size 10. I'm getting 200 requests a second. And then I've got 40, about 48 milliseconds of, ob, of mean object hold time. Now what that would be is like if it's a connection pool, it, it might take me 48 milliseconds to query the database and walk the result set and then return my thing. So how long the clients hold the thing, how long it takes. This, this is really, this is, you know, these, these together make a queuing system. The math, the math for this stuff is, you know, it, it's, it's actually, um, uh, it, 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 the math is very well known. It's not a perfect model of a pool, but it's actually not a bad model. And if you look at the, there's online calculators that'll do, that'll simulate MMM, MMC queues. The, what basically the model, the idea there is that you've got inner arrival times with a mean. It's a Poisson process that's determining the arrivals. You've got service times with a mean specified and the service times are exponentially distributed. And then you've got a certain number of service agents, which in this case would be objects in the pool. If you know those numbers, you can often get these kinds of numbers just from the parameters of how your pool works, or of how your application works and how your resource providers behave. Then you can actually run through and calculate. Notice that I'm gonna now have, it's gonna be about 151 milliseconds. Now, just, just to, to kind of put this in perspective, the pool itself, we slam, when I slam the heck out of pool with a whole lot of threads, it's really hard for me to get performance to go above a few hundredths of a millisecond in, you know, in, in getting 
in the, the response back from the pool. The pool itself is not what's going to determine what happens here. What, what's going to determine what happens here is your, um, the, the dynamics of how your objects are being used and how your factories work. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to stop here. We have a, a few minutes for questions. I, I wanted to have, uh, give people opportunity to ask any questions. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't wait, so I don't know if you covered this in the beginning. Um, version 2, is that, that's available in Tom, that's going to be available in Tomcat 8, right? Yes, yes. Okay. And can you use it in Tomcat 7? Or does it cause problems since the version 1 is not uh, No, it's, it's a different package, so you can drop it in a web application in Tomcat 7 and you can do it in Tomcat 7, but with an application. You can't use it in the common loader? Uh, you could. Yeah, that, that's a, another. Um, Yeah, that was the key point I was going to make. Is the Tomcat package renames everything, okay. so you can mit, mix and match. You, it does require JDK 1.7. So you're, you know, if you're going to drop into an application in running under Tomcat or anywhere else, you're going to need 1.7. But as soon as you have 1.7, you can. You also also uh, pool uh, JD or DBCP2 requires pool two. It doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, please, please use it. Please report issues. Yeah. Yeah, the, for the pool, the pool, you'll get the default names, but it will register. That's kind of the, the I was going to ask you about this. Um, the DBCP will not quite self-register. It should, but it doesn't. Uh, yeah, I, I, well, I can fix it. It doesn't, pre-register isn't, the set JMX name doesn't call pre-register. See, there you go. So, uh, so but that, I mean, that's a slight bug. I mean, this is all brand new. Um, but the, uh, and to, in order, you know, to, to, to get that, I, ha I call pre-register. But in any case, uh, pre-register is public, though, so in, it might be fair enough. That you think you have to do that. Uh, uh, definitely, I know it does work if you. So I've got a little app I use at home and stuff as well as MSX and that. Um, and basically, that's how I've got all the JMX stuff working the right way. It's actually adapted to what's on the And it definitely works with Tomcat, so it might be something we won't be able to write directly to Tomcat to make that work, but it will take a while to keep it straight and keep it in the package. Yeah. Uh, pool does self register, though. So if you, if you just. Uh, all you have to do is fire up a pool and immediately it'll show up. Uh, but we, we are, you know, this is new code. And uh, we're very interested in getting feedback. We're also very interested in, uh, in getting more people involved. And, you know, patches and, uh, you know, look at the code. Um, the documentation is significantly improved, but still needs work. Well, it, it's kind of funny, I was thinking about it the other day, that. Uh, pool one was so was terribly documented for so long, and 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 I was part of the problem. I I, I tried to work on it, and I and I would I would screw things up, and then I I scratch my head, and then I'd work on it a little bit more, and then I I kind of I realized as we were doing pool two, I felt a little bit better, not as quite as guilty, because that some of our problems in in pool one were you could not specify the behavior. It was, it, it was devilishly hard because of the, there, was, there was sort of almost structural design bugs in it that made it extremely hard to specify the behavior. Whereas uh, in pull one, pull two, it's much cleaner. So, uh, And, and, and also subject to change. We'd fix a bug, and we'd fix a bug, and this bizarre, you know, incomprehensible documentation was now false again. 
uh, for, and it had to be, you know, it was just terrible. Whereas now we got simpler contracts in pool two. Uh, and, yeah, and you can follow it. You remember in pool one. No, well, uh, it, it, can't, it can't at all be because, see, part of it, really what I mentioned at the very beginning, the, the changing the, pool, the, pool, the, the pooled object abstraction is essential in pool two. Pool one did not understand those things, never would. Elegantly simple design, great for you know, maybe super memory constrained environments, but um, just not reasonable for today. So. Uh, is it DBCP you're talking about or pool? Um, yeah, DBCP is not bad at all. It's just sort of uh, there's some property names yeah. that have changed. Well, no, that's only only Tomcat that has that stuff because you'll you you see what right, it's it's when you use that factory nonsense where you. The way that Tomcat does it with the, you name a bunch of properties and try to find them and all that stuff, it, a normal sane client who's just using it directly, they'll, they'll use a setter. And the setter, they're going to type ahead and they're going to find the right thing. It's, it's, that, it's that property bag mumbo jumbo that... Yeah. Excuse me? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, no, only um, now DBCP handles that. DBCP handles that for you. The you know all the connection objects, at least we hope <laughs> that the poolable connections correctly uh, implement or don't implement equals, so that uh, that problem is not that problem. You only have to worry about if you're directly using pool. Uh, DBCP takes care. DBCP should not be a problem really. Modulo the property names. Uh, and uh, making sure, obviously, you have the right, um, you know, JDBC version and JDK and all that kind of nonsense. The only thing to watch out for is um, DBC2 using generics to write the right workstations that hold a bunch of warnings. Um, but if you go to do a new generic, then they'll just all go away. But that, that's only ever that's only ever going to cause warnings. It's not actually causing a failure. All right. We have like one minute or something, I think, or zero. Yeah, and we're, you know, there's, we're looking at the code, yeah. so. Watch out for the ones where I say, yes, that's doable, but it took quite a bit of work. All right. Those are the ones you don't want to do first. Uh, but there are, there are some simple ones in there as well. Yeah, and, and, and you know, use the, use the components and, and give us feedback. So, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.